Join me in welcoming our moderator, Mark Nelson, Managing Director of Radiant Energy Group to the stage to discuss the new era of environmentalism. Let's welcome Axeli Rivari of the Finnish Green Party. Kirsten Zaitz, co-founder of Mothers for Nuclear. Dr. Ben Hurd, senior consultant from Fraser Nash Consultancy. Jeremy Harrell, chief strategy officer from Clearpath. Tyson Culver, director of the documentary Juice, Power, Politics and the Grid. <laughs> Julia Galotz, Youth and Environmental Advocate from Poland. <laughs> Alfred Mabeo, Youth Advocate and Entrepreneur from Sierra Leone. Welcome everybody, it's me versus lunch, and I intend to make lunch lose. Uh, we have another mega panel. Um, any of you who have seen the Baraka nuclear plant see that it's incredible to see 1,400 megawatts after 1,400, after 1,400, after 1,400. That's, that's millions of people powered. Well, we have, uh, with all due respect to our hosts, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of the most extraordinary people that I have had the pleasure of working with or meeting recently uh, from around the world. So, a new era of environmentalism. The old era of environmentalism had a few issues for those of us who uh, started coming to climate conferences to talk about nuclear. In front of you on this stage are people who have uh, paid a very significant cost, not to be here, but to do what they did. In a way, coming up here today is, uh, it's the visual part of the victory that they paid for many, many years ago. We've got seven powerful stories. I'm gonna dive in straight away. As we hear those stories, we're gonna hear what the new era of environmentalism is doing right, that the old era of environmentalism now fading away, was doing wrong. I'm gonna start with Dr. Ben Hurd. I know there's an order here, but I need to start with Dr. Ben Hurd because in some ways, a lot of stories in this room start with Dr. Ben Hurd. Uh, ben, you're from Australia, um, and how many, how many Australian government officials joined us for this epic-making announcement earlier at COP? Uh, I, was, I wasn't there, Mark. Um, so I'm not, not in a position to say. Um, I'm going to make a, a good answer, uh, which is that Australia is a key part of the global nuclear fuel cycle and we, we will stay that way as a, as a global supplier of uranium and I'm, I'm very proud of that and I might leave it at that for here today. Excellent. Okay, then let me say this. Um, when did you start thinking nuclear energy was something to believe in? Uh, 2000... Nine, I can make it, and it came out of depression and desperation, to be perfectly honest. So it was um, at the end of uh, having uh, retrained myself in a master's degree to be able to work in sustainability and to work on climate change, and then having the experience of working on climate change and being able to work on climate change adaptation projects, where I was thinking about how we will adapt to the change coming down the pipeline. And there are a few better ways to get acquainted with the risks that we're facing there. And then looking at those risks and then looking at the portfolio of solutions that I was seeing were available and uh, trademark approved to be applied to that solution. Now, that was particularly driven home for me in trying to do an assessment of the amount of energy uh, and offsets that would be required for a single desalination plant in Australia as we enter a new era of uh, water insecurity and drought and acquainting myself with just what that quantum of energy is against what the solutions that we had available and discovering that we are outgunned. We are outgunned in this fight 
with the solutions that we have available. And I had never, ever considered nuclear power before that point. And it took some time and some introspection to uh, take myself on a bit of a journey with the technology to come to a point where I concluded that not only uh, had I changed my view, but I, I really needed to put some effort into helping other people understand what I had come to understand about that. And that started a whole new journey, which in a sense, I guess, you know, the latest chapter is here today, but that in, involved, again, retraining. It involved a, a PhD that, that uh, came uh, out of collaborations with academics that I had uh, been able to connect with. It's, uh, you know, we've heard from the previous panel, and I won't repeat it, but the fundamentals of nuclear technology are so powerful, um, such that the complexities and the challenges that we face um, you can still get out of the bed in, in you can still get out of bed in the morning and know that you are behind the right thing and it's worth doing uh, and, and that has stayed with me on the whole journey Ben um, so. Thank you. so you in a coal country with a ban on nuclear wanted to get into sustainability at the cusp of an extraordinary uh, renewable energy revolution where Australia is in many ways a leader and you, from that, found nuclear energy. That led you to a PhD. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how you acted on discovering this thing, which evidently very few Australians had, had uh, discovered and acted on at the time you did? Um, I put together a slide presentation, actually, called um, Nuclear Power from Opponent to Proponent. And I drafted the seven reasons that I could think of for myself as to why I had been an opponent of nuclear power over my life. And I then explained the, the uh, intellectual steps that I'd taken to overcome each one of those objections, such to the point where if I were to, to obey my own approach to the world, I had to change my mind. Um, I booked a room, a uh, free room, from Adelaide City Council. I sent out invitations to as many people as I had networks for at the time, and I gave that presentation um, to three people. Um, uh, one I was married to, one was my father. Um, and, uh, um, but uh, the third um, said, you know, that was really good, actually. I'm from the Technology Industry Association. Would you consider coming and doing that again? And that was the first time I met a man called Barry Brook, Professor Barry Brook at the University of Adelaide, who became my friend, mentor, PhD thesis. The second presentation was to about 80 to 100 people. And a lot of people said, we needed that. That's, that's good stuff. We really needed that. And so that was a matter of, OK, this is something that's worth doing. And I evidently, I have a way of explaining that process that I've been through, which has meaning. That leads to writing, that leads to media, that leads to analysis, that leads to the demand to professionalise and bring qualifications, original contributions, academic papers, to um, increasingly raise the quality of the argument from what was a desperately low quality argument in Australia, where there was essentially no competition in the conversation, um, to, a, to a point where there is um, strong, clear competition in the conversation. Uh, and that was, a, um, that was a personal journey you've mentioned at considerable cost. Yes, I mean, if you were to flash back to 2007 and 8 in Australia, as someone who just qualified in sustainability, I, I mean, pursuing wind and solar at that time would have been logical, popular, easy, fundable, um, fruitful career. Um, it just wasn't right. That, you know, that wasn't the, the lever that I was looking for that had the caliber to address the challenge that I know climate change to be. Uh, so take a different road. Is this your first COP bid? <laughs> no, it's my third COP. And it, they're all kind of like this in your experience where you have a, <laughs> a very fine hotel, um, a giant audience of yes. people who believe. Uh, this is so familiar. It's like pulling on a pair of old shoes. Um, no, uh, so in Paris in 2015, uh, myself and, and four other uh, people, not unlike my peers here on stage, were the first people ever to speak for nuclear technology. Just a ragtag bunch of, of activists. Myself, Kirsty Gogan, Rowley Partnan from Finland, uh, the late Stephen Tyndale, um, in Paris. Uh, and Paris in 2015 
was not even talking about nuclear for itself. You couldn't find it discussed in the French pavilion. In 2017 in Bonn, um, you know, you, you, nothing tells you you're an outsider like sitting outside and being ignored. And that's where me and Rowley and Kirsty were again, um, because the World Nuclear Association had been declined sponsorship um, of, uh, of an event. Um, so coming here this year is a little bit like a victory lap in a sense. Um, and then I also need to have a reality check and let's have a little lesson about environmentalism and advocates and what our actual value is and that's discomfort. We should be very proud of this pledge and I know the work that's gone into to making it happen and it is extraordinary. And the firing gun on this uh, was shot 30 years ago. Now, this is when COPS began, 30 years ago. And I think that after 30 years, we've made it to the starting line with shoelaces tied up, to be quite honest. Now, I don't want to uh, um, downplay the, cr the critical turnaround at this COP, but at the same time, make no mistake, it should never have been in question that this technology needed to grow and grow fast to meet this challenge of climate change. And I want to refer to what we do know how to do well in, in nuclear which is safety, and that's what we, we you know, Fraser Nash Consultancy delivers services into the nuclear fuel cycle. We understand the nuclear safety culture, and that the nuclear safety culture is about discomfort. And that's what I'm doing here with all of you right now, it's discomfort, right? It's about never satisfied. It's about excellence. It's about always seeking better. And that is why the nuclear power industry has been driven to be such an ex extraordinarily safe industry. Now, we need to take all of that never satisfied, technical excellence, always seeking better that we have applied to safety, now we need to apply it to growth and we need to show everyone that those things are not exclusive and can happen together. We, we have the intellectual firepower and toolkit to do it, it needs to be reapplied now. And advocacy and uh, the work that I, I have done historically, not so much now in, in my career and my work, it's about discomfort and I don't shy away from that. And if you, the advocates in your life aren't making you uh, uncomfortable, you get new ones. So uh, there's a documentary out and uh, for those of you enjoying this new era of nuclear energy, which as you'll see is fundamentally connected to the new era of environmentalism, you must see this docu documentary. Director Frankie Fitton, followed a ragtag bunch of nuclear <laughs> advocates, activists, around for many, many years. The film cuts off right as there seems to be a little bit of something stirring. That little bit of something stirring, you effectively saw just before me. You saw a whole stage filled with incredible advocates for nuclear who have been involved for several years. But if you want to see the pain it came from, this documentary, Atomic Hope, Starring, of course, Eric Meyer back there. Hi, already. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you see in COP in 2017, you see Ben Hurd, who's up here talking about excellence and safety, sitting at a table that no one wants to visit on the literal outside of the grounds of COP, rejected, not here enjoying hospitality, rejected attempting to give people one banana at a time and nothing. Nothing inside, knowing time may be running out for emissions, sitting outside, rejected. Now that's a bit of a downer story, so I want to talk about another documentary that's come a little bit later. Tyson. Tyson is here, and he is the director of JUICE, Power, Politics, and the Grid. Wow, you must be an energy insider. Tyson, could you tell us about your environmental journey and how you heard about nuclear energy? Sure. Um... I, I would say that um, I am an accidental uh, energy insider. Um, I, uh, I have a good friend named Robert Bryce, and he told me he was going to write a book. And he started listing off stats and facts about how women and girls are impacted by the absence of electricity and how much power goes into a data center and how it's comparable to that of a marijuana dispensary and a million other things. And I'm like, this sounds great. And he's like, yeah, it's going to be a great book. I'm going to write it. I think I, wanna, I think I wanna make a movie about it too. And I'm like, well, I'd like to help you with it. And so that's, that's kind of what we did. And then we went out and over the course of, geez, what was it? I think a three year period, we interviewed 50 people from seven countries on five continents to tell the human story of electricity and why power equals power. And that was our last documentary. That was Juice, How Electricity Explains the World. Um, 
and I got fascinated by it. Um, so question, you mentioned Robert Bryce was telling you about women and girls terribly impacted by lack of electricity. I was under the impression that environmentalism didn't really have that much to do with people except as a problem. You're telling me that this isn't about, say, the savanna or the whales. The new era of environmentalism seems to have people in it. I think I'm probably less an environmentalist and more a humanist. I think if you talk about climate change and you're not talking about energy poverty, you're having a disingenuous conversation. Um, that was never more apparent than our very first trip on my first film when I went to India. And I met a family of eight that had a single light bulb in their house, and I'd never seen that. And that is what stuck with us throughout the course of the making of that film. And then we took it um, a different direction when we did Juice, Power, Politics, and the Grid, which comes out next month, January 31st. It'll be, we'll be giving it away uh, free on YouTube. Um, we were lucky. We were fiscally sponsored by the International Documentary Association. And we have a five-part series. And it starts with the integrity of the grid and why it's kind of messed up. And we thought it was going to be a domestic story. Um, and then the war in Ukraine happened. The world changed, as it often does. And we turned it into a, a, a deeper dive into all the things that are happening. And we wrapped the, the, the first part of the series is the Texas blackout. And then we talk about how the US grid was built. And the second part is a little bit different, where we go into a couple different things about you know, energy poverty. Third part, we get into um, renewables. Fourth part is the nuclear renaissance. And the fifth part is probably my favorite. You know the, you know the term, industrial cathedrals. And it is very much about what people's lives look like when they have electricity versus when they don't. Because to me, energy poverty is here. And I am, I am absolutely an environmentalist. I, 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 I care about it. I'm a Democrat. My wife and I own a video production company. We have a mantra. When people think, they decide. When people feel, they act. <laughs> and stats and facts are great. But if you don't have human stories to like really nail down those stats and facts, it, they, just start, they just start flying by. Because I was terrible in math and science. And that never mattered to me. But when I saw what was happening to Rahana Jamadar in Mujlishpukur, India, my life changed. And now I'm talking about the environment and electricity. Tyson, I love that story. Women, girls impacted by electricity. Now you're talking about environmentalism by chasing that story all the way to the end of the line. Yeah. You started maybe with a little bit of a hazy vision, but you're, here's my observation. New era of environmentalism, the way you've put it, is starting with something you absolutely know, you absolutely care about, an impact you can see with your own eyes, and when you chase it to the end of that road, nuclear energy has made a new environmentalism. I think that's beautiful. But uh, you said you were shocked to go into a room and see a single light bulb. I'd like to turn to my, my friend Alfred. I was invited to uh, give a short talk, the African Young Generation in nuclear two years ago, and I, I thought, oh, this would be fun. I'd like to go. I didn't really know about AYGN. And so I say, do you have a travel budget? And I was told, actually, we pretty much expect everyone, even those in Africa, to, to just come on Zoom. So I found, I found somebody who said that they could make the plane ticket work if I paid the other half. I came to the conference. Ticket got messed up. I arrived at the last moment of the conference, covered in sweat from the airport, and gave a quick talk of no particular note, and then met some of the most extraordinary people that you've been able to see at this conference. Alfred, um, you are how old? 33. 30 today. 33? 30 today. 30 today. Alfred is 30 hey. today. Hey. Happy birthday. Alfred is the uh, founder and CEO of Leotech. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Um, thank you so much, Mark, and I am so privileged to be here. Um, Leotech is a skills training center we established in Sierra Leone because we found a gap in the education system. Um, Sierra Leone has an issue whereby you have the engineering education system that lacks some certain amount of qualities that young people need to grab a job in the job market. So we found a, a gap in terms of digital skills. So you see people go through uh, university education in Sierra Leone, they graduate as engineers, but when they go and compete for jobs in the job market, they lose those jobs to foreign engineers who come in simply because they are competent, they have 
uh, digital skills, extra skills that are added to their uh, university degree. So we found that as an issue. So myself and a few colleagues uh, founded Leotech, where we do skills training in, in, in digital proficiency for young engineers. So we found that in 2020, and since then we've trained over 400 young engineers. And about how many Leonian engineers are there? Um, we have um, over two or 3,000 engineers. So you've, since 2020, saw a gap and f founded an organization to get your countrymen and women hired on as engineers instead of foreign engineers so they could build your country, and you've trained at that time almost 25% of the engineers in your entire country. I would just like to say that this is extraordinary and explains something about what you're going to hear next. He's not really on stage to talk about how you should train uh, engineers in your own country to do work, though I think it's a topic very dear to many of the people here. Alfred, could you tell us a little bit about your uh, upbringing? Yes, um, thank you so much, Mark. Um, I guess the privilege to talk here today is one of the best birthday gifts I have had so far, and um, I'm so amazed. I just want to start by saying, um, based on my observation of the demography of this audience, I am probably the only person in this um, audience currently that only had access to electricity at age 19. And that was when I was moved from the provinces of Sierra Leone to Freetown, where I attended high school. And since then, it has been like an eye-opener, seeing the difference between having electricity at home and not having electricity at home. So growing up without electricity, you could picture that in your context from the developing country's perspective, that of the developed country's perspective. It meant that uh, you grew up not having access to light bulbs at home for you to study. You grew up not having the opportunity to buy ice cream on the street to eat simply because there's no refrigerator. You grew up not having access to an electric goose to iron your uniform to school. It meant that you grew up without access to dishwasher. So most of those things that are taken for granted in the developed world are things that can really save millions of lives in my country. So when I hear they say countries like Sweden discarded nuclear power plants that is of a capacity over four gigawatts, I said, you guys need to repent. Four gigawatts. <laughs> in the African context can save millions of lives. It means that four gigawatts, for example, in the context of the West Africa, you can have electricity in the hospital where children can have access to intensive care units. You can save more women's life from dying at the delivery or labor room. So I see a, a, a big difference or a wall of difference between the global south and the global north and between the developed and the developing countries. So growing up in that situation as a young man or growing up, I mean, schooling in such a situation gave me the inspiration to pursue a career in, 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 in clean energy. Um, I am not currently in the clean energy sector because I did my bachelor's in mechanical engineering, but I'm so much looking forward in pursuing the career in the clean energy sector. And that is what brought me with advocacy for nuclear in Sierra Leone because um, I got exposure to the Africa Young Generation in nuclear because of my clean energy aspirations. And from that, I have learned so much on how clean nuclear energy is and how promising nuclear power could be in the African context, especially considering the fact that Africa does not only need access to electricity, but now we want to have access to electricity not as the developed world did in the past, they made effective, I mean, they made so much use of dirty fuel and coal and uh, oil and gas to power their economies, and they are now developed countries. But Africa is not taking that path. We want to take a path whereby we can use clean energy sources and provide cheap electricity for our people. And that is very difficult because you want to kill two baths with a single stone. You want to provide clean, cheap electricity to your people. At the same time, you want to not pollute the environment. You want to reduce your carbon footprint. So I think that is where nuclear power comes in because you, 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 you cannot do both things that I mentioned earlier with renewables because they are very, they are very um, vulnerable. They are vulnerable and intermittent. But when you combine renewables and um, nuclear power, then now you are sure that you can really provide power to your people and you can power your industries and you can actually have electricity at a much cheaper cost. So, 
that is the reason I am into clean energy advocacy and, of course, environmentalism. So a young man from Sierra Leone, which has some of the lowest carbon emissions in the world, points a way to a new era of environmentalism that does not accept merely that Sierra Leone has the lowest, some of the lowest emissions in the world, but says that this is a sign of extraordinary loss, pain, suffering, and death, and that we need the low emissions, but with the beauty, the light, the clean energy, the lack of cutting forests that we all take for granted. Thank you, Alfred. I'd like to turn to Julia. Julia is from Poland, and for some of you who have been in the nuclear industry for a long, for a long time, if you heard about a young idealist in a uh, coal-powered nation who was studying biology and law, I would ask, do you think that this person is against nuclear energy or for? Julia, at what point did you decide uh, that nuclear energy was more of a help than a hurt? <clears throat> So, you know, I'm a part of Gen Z, and we were growing up in this world that was constantly changing and is constantly changing, and at school I was learning about climate change, actually about greenhouse effect, and uh, that was disturbing me because I w wanted to be a biologist from a very young age, and I was, like, worried about biodiversity loss, even though I didn't know that it's called like that at the time. But I was worrying about the extinction of species and, uh, and everything. So I tried to look, and I found Fridays for Future uh, movement in Poland, and they were protesting in the street for, like, safe future for clean energy sources. And it went like that for some years, and nothing changed. So I was like, okay, what is actually going on? 100% renewables, that was one of their uh, like demands, actually, uh, is not working. What can possibly work? Because, you know, we have to be pragmatic. We need to solve the problems that we are struggling with right now because we want to have a future. So uh, it turned out that there is nuclear, and I get a little bit inside the topic, and it turned out that with nuclear, you can also land spur and save the nature with, at the same time, elevating the humanity, providing the electricity to the people, and, you know, providing the energy for the hospitals, for the prisons, for the institutions that need the electricity constantly, every day, every hour, every minute. So, if you can do both, save the nature and elevate the humanity, I think nuclear is the only solution to, to do that. And Julia, could you tell something about your board member at Photo for Climate, in my opinion, a pioneering institution of new environmentalism, can you tell me how uh, Photo for Climate has proposed to solve this land sparing issue in Poland? Yes, so in Poland we are investing right now in not one but two uh, big scale nuclear power plants and also some SMRs as the announcement said yesterday. So uh, we proposed uh, in terms of the first nuclear power plant that we want one like national park for one reactor. You know, and this is like a combination that can allow old environmentalists and new environmentalists have the same interest. Uh, so the old environmentalists wanted a national park. Yes, exactly. You want a national park. Yes, exactly. You want, because the new environmentalism evidently looks at energy and how it impacts our lives and takes it very seriously, you're saying you want, you will make a trade. We let you build, as environmentalists, the new environmentalists, we let you build a national park, or sorry, a nuclear plant. In exchange, we get a national park that shows you the land that was spared. Exactly, and maybe a little backstory, because uh, we, the, the newest par national park that uh, is in Poland is from 2001. We are the same age with the, <laughs> the newest national park in Poland. So, you know, in, in 22 years, we haven't invested in new national park in Poland, even though we have some areas that should be protected legally. Uh, and environmentalists, who sometimes are against nuclear power, they were fighting for, uh, like, opening a new protected area in Poland. 
Uh, and so we proposed that if we can like combine these two and invest in nuclear and at the same time ask our government to open a new uh, national park, we should do that. But what's interesting in the whole case is that like the, the part of the movement which is against nuclear power, they didn't support the whole initiative because they're maybe a little bit scared to change their mind. Maybe they, they just treat it a little bit like a religion, but they don't know what to do with that. Actually, they are not against, but they are also not for. They are still like somewhere in between. This is something that was really surprising for them, uh, and they don't know what to do with that. I think that's, that's our huge power, that we are this era of new environmentalists, and we are people who are thinking absolutely outside the box, and like the world is the world doesn't know how to into which box to put us because we are actually not it's not possible to put us into the closed box so i think that's that's something amazing and we should take advantage of that i love that story and we'll move to somebody who was supposed to be in a box because when you work in a nuclear company you have obligations to the public you have obligations to the company, and you have obligations to your family. I want to introduce you to somebody who has dealt with this in one of the most extraordinary sagas, painful and ultimately triumphant. Kristen Zaitz, it is an incredible honor to share a stage with you today. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your fight to save your own nuclear plant from closure? Yeah, um, is this on? It is. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I work at Diablo Canyon Nuclear Power Plant in California, and we are the last operating nuclear power plant in the state. Um, I grew up in a small town in Northern California in the mountains with not a lot of resources. I strongly valued land conservation. I did my high school senior project on John Muir and thought I might go into land conservation um, as an adult. I had um, a group of environmentalist friends who uh, didn't support nuclear energy. And um, I went to college near Diablo Canyon and thought, this is a very scary place. So I, uh, I got my information where most young people do it, from the media. And The Simpsons taught me that there was um, definitely th some things to be scared about, three-eyed fish and the waste was green and in barrels. So when I got the chance to work there um, in college, I thought I'd go find out what was really going on at that nuclear power plant and tell my friends about it. So I did that and I've worked there ever since. <laughs> um, I'm an engineer by training and um, and I spent a long time myself getting comfortable with the technology. Uh, although, you know, long story short, I'm still there and I obviously support nuclear now. I mean, I founded a group called Mothers for Nuclear, right? So it says it right in the tagline. But I, I was very scared of nuclear energy for a long time. Um, and I think that um, over many years of asking questions about the technology, I finally became comfortable with it and wondered why it was such a secret that what we do in nuclear energy um, is so valuable to humanity. Mark, no. I actually forget your question, but no, it's I would okay. like That's to talk about start. that. So Kirsten, Mothers for Nuclear, yeah. I remember in 2016 seeing a march from the Bay Area to, to um, all the way to the Capitol. I remember seeing other demonstrations with uh, a very young girl there. Um, is Kate here in the audience? Kate Zaitz? Kate? Can you wave, honey? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Kate is 11 and is a student at Pacheco Elementary um, out near Diablo Canyon. And she is one of the most experienced nuclear activists in the world from age five now to 11. Age three, Mark, yeah. Age three. <laughs> so we're talking, um, that is the link of the, of the movement to put nuclear at the heart of a totally new environmentalism. Did your um, experience at Diablo Canyon prepare you for a very long career that would continue on and on until retirement at Diablo? Well, I'll just say, um, I, after many years working in nuclear as an engineer, 
um, changed my mind. I actually worked on the seismic analysis at Diablo Canyon, and if you know much about the history of the anti-nuclear movement um, in California, it was a lot of it was based on concerns about seismicity in the region. And so um, I, becoming comfortable with, with that was really important for me to be able to then advocate for the technology. Um, and so I, uh, uh, where did you want me to go with this? I'm, I'm just um, going to go down my own rabbit trail. In 2016, so, okay. the decision was so made. So in 2016, um, I heard that Diablo Canyon and other existing nuclear plants were under threat of premature closure. And after taking so long to change my mind, I thought, this is horrific. I need to do something about it. Um, and so my good friend and coworker Heather Hoff and I founded Mothers for Nuclear. It was very lonely. When we said we founded an organization called Mothers for Nuclear, people laughed at us. Um, and it was certainly not the warm welcome that we're experiencing this year at COP. Um, so, so what's happened with that? 2016, a nearly yeah. irreversible decision was made. So yeah, we marched. Um, we, we, we took action. We took our children with us places. How many times do you see children at a nuclear event? I mean, in 2016 when we formed, I went to a women in nuclear event where a senior level executive, a woman, was there to give a plenary talk in front of the audience of women. She had her daughter with her. They didn't let her daughter in the room to listen to her speech. I mean, that tells you the um, lack of transparency and kind of the closed doors that the nuclear industry has operated with for so many years, and I wanted to break that wide open. It's been very uncomfortable, but we've been successful in doing that so far. There's still a long way to go. I see one young person in this room, and I would just say that our audience, our customers, are as diverse as the entire world. And so the people we are speaking to need to look like them. Uh, and we need to tailor our messages to them. I see um, we've been successful in turning around Diablo Canyon, which is where you wanted me to go with this, and I'll get there. Um, public opinion has changed in California dramatically. Um, but that shift in public opinion was made possible by the support and the relentless action of advocates, many of whom you see in this room. Dr. Ben Hurd here, he was there at our initial march for environmental hope. Eric Meyer, who's sitting right in front of me, who quit his job um, to come out to California and help us organize this. We did this all on a shoestring budget. And, um, and over time, through the engagement of so many um, committed activists, we were able to change public opinion and enable the change in political opinion that brought us to the point where now, one year ago, Diablo Canyon, the, the course of Diablo Canyon has changed and we will continue operating for at least another five years, hopefully 20 or more. Could we get a quick round of applause? <laughs> so, Kristen, I think we need to move on to, uh, for me, a very important gentleman, Jeremy Harrell here, Chief Strategy Officer at ClearPath Foundation. ClearPath is, for some of the people I've talked to, they're one of those organizations that you see the name ClearPath and they come to nuclear events and you're like, what's ClearPath? Oh well, there's Jeremy again. Jeremy's a, ge a nice guy. Let's say hi again and move on to the next conversation. ClearPath is one of the, in my opinion, founding organizations that has made the highest pack in creating the new environmentalism. Um, there's a lot of details that they probably will not take credit for publicly, but they effectively made a lot of things that are now flowering today. If you, if you saw this conference and it seemed like there were incredible voices out there around the world, extremely clear-sighted efforts came out of ClearPath. Jeremy, I know we're a little bit tight on time and we still have Axeli to hear from. Could you say something about the Washington you arrived in and the Washington you're leaving? Or, or that you're that you're coming from sure. to COP. Can you say something about that transition? Yeah, absolutely. And, and so you know, ClearPath was founded 10 years ago by a visionary businessman, Jay Faison, who very fortunately made had a very successful career in tech, sold his company um, around the age of 40 and wanted to figure out how he's going to get back. And he was frustrated with Washington because there was many folks on the left who were pushing 100% renewables, many folks on the right who were pushing drill, baby, drill, and nothing in the middle on reasonable, pragmatic policy. And he was a lifelong Republican who had largely been con it became increasingly concerned about climate. And so he started ClearPath. And, and 
and we evaluated the landscape as ClearPath started and, and tried to figure out how can we best impact the public policy debate and, and really further public policy in the United States around climate, with nuclear being a big piece of that. And you know, I think what was really innovative in, in what's structured is it's a, it's a bit of a family of organizations or initiatives, right? We have think tank functions, we have direct lobbying, we have philanthropic advocacy, and then direct political advocacy. Jay, Jay is one of the single largest political donors in, in, in the United States uh, to the Republican Party. And so we combined all of those things to try to help foster the ecosystem around pragmatic clean energy and climate policy. And today, particularly in the case of nuclear, public bipartisan support in the halls of Congress in Washington, D.C. have never been higher. Uh, when I left government uh, about eight years ago, I came to Clear Paths uh, seven, uh, a little over uh, seven years ago, uh, the debate on nuclear was still very divided. Uh, and, and folks were not excited about it. Um, and the, the left, there was a lot of con concerns on the left, and even conservatives had significant concerns about um, you know, costs and, uh, and things along those uh, items. Today, for example, in July, a significant nuclear fuel vote that happened in the United States Senate where it passed 96 to 3, uh, direct investments in the, in the U.S. nuclear fuel cycle um, and how to really foster uh, and, and take control of our, our nuclear energy security. Uh, the three, the pe three people who voted against it, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and uh, Ed Markey. So three of our signature nuclear detractors for the last, for the last 40 years. An incredible sign of how the debate has shifted in Washington, D.C. as Republicans have come at it, whether it's for climate reasons, for energy security reasons, for afford affordability and competitiveness reasons, or even geopolitical competition. And Democrats have aligned around, around climate and economic-related reasons and all of the above. And so it's really incredible to see how, how it's evolved. And, and I, I'm really excited about the future because I think we can come here to talk this year and say U.S. leadership in nuclear is here to stay. Um, and we're putting our money where our mouth is, our entrepreneurs are, are racing towards commercialization and offering a wide variety of, of uh, offerings to the, the uh, global market. And uh, I, I think there are huge things ahead for the U.S. industry. 96 to three, 96 to three. Uh, that is new era sounding to me. We finally have an interesting young man Actually, Ruvari, you are a paid-up member of the Green Party, which is, of course, why you're on stage here at a nuclear uh, conference, the edge of COP. Um, new era of environmentalism. It sounds good, but uh, it needs to turn into action if it's going to be as successful as the previous era of environmentalism. You told me about two very interesting little moments today. The Green Party of Finland, I think those of us on social media, we've seen this great man bites dog story, Green Party fights for nuclear. Could you tell me a little bit first about, he's a, you're a young climate delegate of Sweden, or of uh, Finland, which means there's two of you in a giant room of the world's young people on climate. Could you tell me about a meeting you had, though, in Spain earlier this year? Yeah, for sure. So, oh, it's loud. <laughs> First of all, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. So, um, as Mark said, um, I'm the Youth Climate Delegate of Finland, so I'm also participating in that capacity in addition to my role in the Green Party. So, um, I told Mark about a story earlier that uh, I participated in the International Energy Agency and the Spanish government's hosted um, summit, uh, Climate and Energy Summit, in the beginning of October this year. So. Uh, I think it was interesting because we were, uh, with my climate delegate partner for Finland, we were speaking with the voices from youth all across Europe in the summit. Uh, it was a ministerial summit with people from all over the world. Fatih Birol was uh, chairing it with Teresa Ribera from the Spanish government. And um, when we were preparing for the conference and talking with youth across the Europe, uh, we were preparing the positions together so that we have the ability to speak on behalf of everyone. Naturally, everyone is not agreeing on every matter. But one thing that I wanted to highlight was nuclear. That's been one of the most important themes for me in my advocacy for the last two years in my role. So that was one thing that I was really passionate to talk about in that conference. Uh, because I, I think that we really have a, a need to raise youth voices regarding this question. So, uh, when we were at the conference, uh, we held a speech, we were all talking about lots of the issues regarding climate and energy, and uh, as an anecdote, I, I actually said during the speech regarding nuclear that um, we, were, we were talking about the problems in nuclear policy in, in Europe, and I said uh, that um, 
sh shutting down fully operational nuclear plants and opening up new coal-fired power stations is like shooting ourselves in the leg. And uh, <laughs> as you can imagine, I got some very sour faces from some uh, countries in Middle Europe uh, after that comment, but I think I got lots of positive feedback from people all over the world, and I think it, it really was something that you need to say. And I think uh, as youth, we have the possibility to contribute and to, to really raise these kinds of issues, which are very crucial. And um, I think it was an interesting, interesting thing, thing uh, with the conference, and, and that's a message I'm hoping to bring forward in COP28 too, and the different forums that I'm able to participate in. And you're here involved in these international negotiations. The youth delegates are there as that, you know, it's supposedly COP is about your future, not necessarily the senior people who are negotiating the agreements. How have you been received among the world's youth? In other words, this era of environmentalism, is it here now? Yeah, I think I've, I've been received very well. Um, in general, uh, if we think about uh, negotiations, their countries always have their own opinions and there are always hard, dis uh, hard discussions and it, it's not always based on science or the best argument. But I think that among youth in Europe, in Finland, and in general in the world, I think the discussions are quite civilized. I think we are able to really change our opinion if a better argument arises. So I've, I've considered that to be very constructive. Naturally, the youth uh, across the globe is not uh, unanimously uh, in, in favor of nuclear, but I think it's been easy to have discussions that are really based on the facts. So we don't necessarily agree with each other, but I think that we've been able to really hear our uh, views and have a dialogue where we can, we can really, really base the discussion on the facts and on science instead of some... Uh, uh, some baggage that we have from the history or the positions that we, we've uh, adapted from, from the older generations. So I've been really happy about that and it's been a very, very, very um, constructive. I also have to tell you a story about this Youth Climate Summit that we had in Finland exactly three weeks ago. So uh, we had this big summit uh, where the, basically the point of the summit was to get the points of view from all, of, all across Finland for us uh, to bring forward uh, in the COP negotiations. So we had over 600 people from all across uh, Finland and also international uh, people participating in the conference. And I think there was an interesting moment where we had the presidential election debate on the stage. And one of the candidates flipped the question um, uh, on the opposite way and asked the audience one question. So his question was, how many people in this hall are, in, are actively in favor of nuclear? Raise your hands. And I think it was really interesting because we had over 600 youths in the room and uh, certainly over 50%, maybe even 60% raised their uh, hands to say that they are actively in favor of nuclear. So I think the narrative has changed quite a lot from what it was before. But I think even more interesting was the follow-up question that this candidate asked. He asked how many people in this room are opposed to nuclear. And I think I saw two or three hands in the whole room of over 600 people from all across Finland. So I think the narrative is changing. It's changing really fast. Um, people are accepting, um, not actively opposed, and I think more and more are in support of nuclear, uh, supportive of nuclear. And that's also uh, quite a lot uh, because of the public debate that we have had in, in Finland. We've had lots of coverage on nuclear. We have had lots of, lots of different um, events. We've had the Olkiluoto Auto Tree, uh, tree uh, project, which has been going for a long time, and now, now it's open, and we're really happy about it. So I think that has been uh, crucial in changing the narrative. And I can promise you that in a year from now, when we are going to have the same conference, I can promise you that even more people are going to raise their hands. And a year from that, even more people, and a year from that, even more people. So I'm, I'm certain about it, that the movement is, is, is uh, going ahead. And I think, think there's a change of narrative going on, because we also have, uh, in the same conference, we, we were also discussing things like climate repair, how technology can prove solutions, and, and people in Finland, the people in Europe, I believe, young people, are much more accepting towards these kinds of solutions that they have been in the past. I think we are looking forward. I think we are having some good dialogue on these subjects and we are agreeing that these are the uh, things that we must have some opinions on. And I think that the discussion is, is science-based and it's, it's, it's a pr uh, productive dialogue. So I'm certain that these kinds of things, uh, we will move forward with them. And I, I'm sure and I hope that this kind of uh, dialogue and this kind of atmosphere that we have in Finland is going to spread to all over the world. And as youth, we are the, 
next decide decision makers, next industry leaders in the world. And I think that we are going to, in the 10 years, uh, that the dialogue on the uh, big level is also going to change to this direction. Thank you, Axeli. So each one of these people has more to their stories, more that can be said, more that they plan to do. I would ask you to bring your questions to them over a delicious lunch. Please go introduce them. Don't let them eat. Um, please tell them what you think as members of the industry for people who put their lives on hold or put their careers at risk to fight for what we are now getting to celebrate at COP28. We heard from Ben Hurd what it felt like to find something out way too early, so early it felt like it was wrong, to be at COP as an outcast, a reject, and then to return as an honored guest of the host country. We've heard from Tyson Culver, who, you know, wasn't a math kid, just had some uh, environmentalism things he wanted to chase after hearing that it was really hard to grow up for women without electricity, and then followed that all the way into making a documentary about electricity and nuclear power. We heard from Alfred, who grew up in the world that shocked Tyson so much when he saw it the first time as an adult, came out of that to train a great fraction of his country's engineers, and then says that that's not enough. He's training the engineers so eventually they will never have that type of poverty again, and they will have nuclear even in his country, proof that anything is possible when talent finds its way to, to power and the right solutions. We heard from Julia with the clever, clever approach of sparing the land to having a nuclear plant. Julia was called out by name by her own country's president at the triple nuclear announcement that was made earlier at COP for her ideas and leadership, and she was there to hear it. Um, we also heard from Kristen Zaitz, who had to go into a nuclear plant as a nuclear engineer to prove to herself it was safe, ended up falling in love with it, and while raising a family and doing her job absolutely as directed and as well as you could ever want as a nuclear employee, went outside the power plant at risk to fight against the policy of closing the last and largest uh, source of clean energy in California, baseload power. And then finally, we heard what it takes to change a nation and to cement this new idea of environmentalism where you can worry about emissions but know how to get things done in business. Jeremy with ClearPath that's done more than will be said on this stage or maybe any stage to bring about the world that we've been celebrating here at COP. And then finally, Axley who walks up and says, yes, uh, three votes against, hundreds for, walked into IEA summit in, Sp in Spain where they're closing nuclear plants and was able to tell the world to their face fearlessly that nuclear energy was the future. This is an era that's coming, it's arriving, it's here at COP28, and I think I can join the rest of you in feeling that going out of this room, going out of COP28, the new era of environmentalism that centers energy for all at the lowest possible cost to the environment, built around net zero made possible by nuclear energy. This era is here to stay. I want you to thank me, uh, or join me in thanking all of our <laughs> panelists. Too. Thank you, everybody. Now, everyone's <laughs> sitting. No one's rushing off to lunch. I don't know whether that's the peer pressure that kept Axeli's young colleagues from saying they're against nuclear power after seeing that hundreds weren't. I can ask for questions, but I think we should check whether we should on timing. How are we? Nope. It's time for lunch. Please, find a table okay. with one of these leaders. I'm stealing the mic. There's a young man here from Burkina Faso, and he is trying to start Young Generation Nuclear in Burkina Faso. Now, all respect to myself and Will Shackle with a difficult context in Australia, I can't think of a greater challenge than that. Find that person, give them a business card, make friends, give them some support. That's a huge challenge. There's not even a university in that country that can teach nuclear engineering. Um, that person's here somewhere. Go find them over lunch and say hello and introduce themselves. Use your time well for us. Thanks. Thank you.